there is this thing called syncretism. It's the inappropriate blending of one nuance of religion with another. I guess you could think of it as kind of the tossed salad of faith. The nation of Israel had tried to synchronize their faith with the faith of the nations around them. And that's why they got sent into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And that spanking by God actually did its job. It worked. They would never, ever, ever be idolatrous again. But when they came home, they ended up having some other problems. Other issues plagued them after returning to the land of Israel. There was lethargy with regarding to getting the temple completed and the altar completed, the city rebuilt. There were Sabbath violations that seemed to be a really difficult thing, which kind of set the stage for what Jesus would encounter 400 years later. And specifically, there was the issue of family life. Family life seemed to be coming apart at the seams. Husbands, wives, children. And that's why we're calling this final lesson from the book of Ezra, chapters 9 and 10, when rebuilding comes home to roost. How are things at home? <laughs> what about the family? Uh, John and Nancy Ortberg have a little magnet on their refrigerator that says, I didn't say it was your fault. I said, I'm going to blame you. Well, that kind of underlines the difficulty of family life at times. And so this issue of syncretism, especially when it bleeds into family, can be really, really bad. There's always tension between what we might call, biblically speaking, the line of Seth and the way of Cain. Even the New Testament mentions the way of Cain. The tension between Israel and the nations. The tension between the harlot who sits on seven hills in the book of Revelation and the bride of the Lamb. And another way to say it is the tension between the church and the world. Does the church set itself against the world so as not to be corrupted? Well, there's something to be said for that. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says that a bad company corrupts good morals. Sometimes by association, we can become polluted. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, avoid the very appearance of evil. So the one hand, you could argue, we need to stay as clean from the world as possible. On the other hand, does the church at times need to blend itself in with the world so as to, with as much solidarity as possible, uh, with regard to their humanity, win them to Christ? Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. This is the tension of how God's people relate to the people of the world and what happens when syncretism sort of, uh, you know, comes into the doorway. One of my friends says it this way, we are actually best for the world when we are most unlike them. And I think depending on where you land on this, that might be the way to think about it. Maybe my differentness, my peculiarity is actually what will help me get a hearing with the uh, unchurched Harrys and unchurched Marys of this world. One thing we can say for at least sure at this time in history with Ezra was that he was trying to draw a very clear line between Israel and the nations. The purpose of this, of course, was to preserve the remnant so that the Messiah could come through the promised line. So you could argue a lot was at stake. What had the potential to corrupt this mostly was the home, the home. God had commanded his people way back, clear back to the time of Moses, to not intermarry with the nations. Now, let me be very clear about this. This was not a decision by God about race. This was a decision by God about religion. This was not a decision by God about skin color. This was a decision by God about sanctification. So interestingly enough, the book of Ezra ends with a mass divorce. It seems so odd unless you read the rest of the story. And that is, how will Ezra lead or bleed into the twin book, Nehemiah? And how will that ready us for the 400 silent years between the Testaments? And how will it get us ready for the coming of the Messiah? So, with regard to the family being in crisis, we see in chapter 9 two things. Penance, 
even Ezra himself, emotionally owning some of this difficulty, and prayer and asking God for forgiveness. So if we look at chapter 9 of Ezra, beginning with verse 1, we'll read these words. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations. Wow. So somebody's ratting on somebody. The officials, whoever they are, are telling Ezra that even the priests and Levites have not been very careful about obeying the laws of Moses when it comes to marriage. In fact, the very harsh word is used, abomination. Abomination will be used three times in this section of scripture. Abomination from the Canaanites, the Hittites, and you got all the other ites <laughs> mentioned here in verse one. Then verse two, for they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race, actually, uh, this probably means their offspring, their children, has been has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men have been foremost. In other words, the leaders have kind of led the charge on this. Verse 3, as soon as I heard this, says Ezra, so this is first person, he's giving us this out of his own testimony, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. The Hebrew word for appalled here that appears more than once means the idea of devastated. And somebody has noted that at least with Ezra, he pulled out his own hair. When we get to Nehemiah, he pulls out other people's hair. So that's kind of strange. But anyway, he goes on to say, Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn, and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord God saying, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush. We haven't seen that word for a while. It's popular with Isaiah and Jeremiah getting to the point where you can't blush anymore. I blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Now that's reading on into verse 6 a little ways, but I think you see the point. There is some significant repentance going on here, even on the part of Ezra. So far as we know, Ezra didn't violate this command. He had married within his religious convictions, and yet he mostly owns the sins of the people for himself. It's the I-we kind of tension that sometimes we see. So Ezra is deeply grieved and fasts and prays. If we're going to get the home right, <coughs> maybe that's the place to start. Penance. Now, let's look at the prayer uh, more broadly that begins in verse 6, which we've already read. So I'll pick up the reading in uh, verse 8. But now for a brief moment, Ezra says, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us as a remnant and to give us a sh secure hold. That Hebrew word actually means nailed it down, <laughs> something that's nailed within his holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. So he's viewing what they came out of in Babylonian captivity as slavery, much like the people of Israel in Egypt. For we were slaves or are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love. There that word is again, his chesed, his covenantal love, his loyal love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins and to give us protection in Judah and Jerusalem. So he's acknowledging this as he starts his prayer, but now comes actually more of the request. Verse 10, and now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments. One of the things about confession in the context of prayer is pretense is over. When we confess our sins to God, there's no more pretense. We're letting it be known that we are laying ourselves exposed to God. Skipping down to verse 13, 
And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve. So there is a consciousness that they didn't get what they should have gotten and have given us as such a remnant as this. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you are you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh, Lord God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped, as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So, in the prayer of Ezra in chapter 9, he is confessing, he is admitting, he is emotionally owning the sins of the people here, but he didn't just pray. He, capital P, prayed. In fact, it's interesting, Ezra chapter 9 kind of lines up with Daniel chapter 9 earlier where Daniel does the same thing, and good luck finding any dirt on Daniel. There's just not much there at all, but he seems to identify himself with the sins of the people. And it also lines up with Nehemiah chapter 9. So you've got Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9, here Ezra 9, where there's these lengthy prayers and making confession and admitting guilt And what he's saying is, we were guilty, and so God punished us. It was idolatry, but now we've come home, and we didn't care about the purity of our bloodlines, which would bring the Messiah. You'll notice how many times the word remnant occurs here. Ezra is not saying that God cannot work through different marriages. Think for a minute about Ruth and Boaz. She's in the Messianic line. So God can still work through it, yes. But there was a reason that God drew a bead between the nations and Israel, and it was so that he could, without compromise, bring his son into this world. So the penance and the prayer. When we get to chapter 10, we see more of the confession and then a confrontation and then a commitment. That's very impressive, to be honest with you, even if you feel like Ezra sort of went beyond what he should have done. Chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, the confession. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. This is serious spiritual gymnastics. They're weeping. They're falling down before God. They're casting themselves before him. They're they're confessing. This is not just a, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep kind of prayer. This is not a bless the food, bless the meat, now let's eat. This is serious business. And we even go on to read, and Shechaniah Verse 2, the son of Jehiel and the sons of Elam addressed Ezra. Here's what the confession is. We've broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Again, it's not as if God can't work through that. Of course he can. But you might think back to their own history, that when Solomon, the great king of Israel, married foreign women, things began to come unglued for his kingdom to where ultimately it was split between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now, there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So as the people confess, they seem to hold out for the steadfast love of God and his faithfulness to them. Verse 3 says, Therefore, let us make a covenant Ah, so the confession goes hand in hand with the covenant, the Hebrew word berit, which means this agreement where one party describes the terms of the agreement. Let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Here the people are are urging Ezra to go forward with this. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests, Levites, and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. 
Wow, things are moving out of the category of prayer of chapter 9 through the confession and covenant of chapter 10, and now we're getting down to business. We're going to put our money where the mouth is, if you will, and we're going to follow through with this particular thing. So I guess what we'd say here is everything is primed just in the right spot for significant revival, if you will. They do bank on the character of God. They do bank on the fact that he is slow to anger. They do bank on the fact that he is a God of steadfast love and a God of covenant, which they're trying to reestablish for themselves. Well, the confession is good on the part of the leaders. It's certainly noble on the part of Ezra, but it leads then finally to a serious confrontation. And we pick that up in verses 6 to 17. We won't read all of that, but a few select verses will help us get our arms around it. Verse 6 of chapter 10, Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Johanahan, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night. Now notice how he spends the night. <coughs> Neither eating bread or drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. This is a leader that doesn't take this stuff lightly. He's really owning this for himself. And the next verse, a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. So he's going to get them all together and he's going to confront them for this faithlessness, as he calls it. And that, this is serious, verse 9, or verse 8, if anyone did not come within three days by order of the officials and the elders, all his property, property should be forfeited, and he himself shall be banned from the congregation of the exiles. This is pretty serious. So since they're making this commitment, they're saying to everybody who has married a foreign wife, you had better show up at this thing. Then verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twelfth day of the month, and all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling, I think they do know that they have been unfaithful because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. Now, that's interesting. <laughs> They're trembling because they know they've been on the edge of obeying God. But there's also just this very obvious thing about rain. And what you have, this will sound like baseball, I suppose, what you have in the verses that follow is a rain delay. And if I could summarize the verses, uh, the leaders come to Ezra and say, hey, because of the rain, would you mind if just the leaders came instead of having the kids and the children, everybody else stand out here in the rain? And basically it's granted. You look a little later in the text and we read in verse 16, then the returned exiles did so. So they sent their leaders instead of themselves and they came up and they made their commitment and it even identifies what day it was. So here you have this confrontation, which then leads to the commitment. Now, the commitment is this last part of Ezra and the last part of chapter 10. I'll just sketch it for you. Verse 18, now there were found some among the sons of the priests who had married foreign women. And get this, it mentions their name. You talk about being called out. And then in verse 21, of the sons of Harim, Verse 23, of the Levites, and the names listed. Verse 24, of the gatekeepers. Verse 25, uh, and of Israel, and several names listed there. And then come to the 44th verse, the very last verse in the book of Ezra and the 10th chapter. All these had married foreign women, and some of the women had even born children. And that's it. <laughs> it seems like a very abrupt odd way to end a book. But maybe it's not so much different than the book about the church in uh, that we call the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends with Paul in Roman house arrest, and it says that he spoke quite openly and unhinderedly. And the book ends. Some feel like, man, that's a big disappointment. All we know is Paul's in Roman house arrest and the gospel's trying to go forward in an unhindered way, but that last word becomes kind of the key. And maybe that's the same thing as we see here. I didn't count them up for you. I didn't read them all for you, but there are 127 names in that last section, if you will. 
They signed on. They made a commitment. We're going to do this. We're going to put away our wives and children that we shouldn't have had in the first place. And the book of Ezra ends. Well, what are we to make of this? (laughs) It seems like a most odd ending. But may I remind you that Ezra and Nehemiah, the next book of the Bible, are actually one book. So in some ways, it didn't end. It goes on, if you will. Are we to think along these lines that Ezra was justified in this mass divorce? Or did Ezra go a little bit overboard? Is this two wrongs to make a right? (laughs) That they had done something wrong, intermarried, and ran the risk of jeopardizing or jettisoning their faith? Or did Ezra just go beyond what he should have? We see other marriages in the Old Testament that are not the way God originally planned it, but God worked through them, even brought the Messianic line through some of them, as we mentioned earlier with Ruth and Boaz. Maybe Ezra went too far. You know, we don't really have anything in the text that tells us that God told him to do this. There are a lot of things in the Bible that people do that don't have God's blessing. You see polygamy. That doesn't have God's blessing, but but it's stated as a historical fact. Maybe Ezra went too far. One of my teachers that I admired greatly in Bible college said that one day in class, and it kind of shocked me because I just assumed if it was in the Bible, then that that had to have God's approval. But think about the friends of Job and how they gave him advice, and it wasn't always spot on advice. Maybe Ezra went too far. Maybe, on the other hand, he was right as rain that this was a very specific situation, so we don't want to principalize and we don't want to take undue, uh, you know, opportunity here. But maybe Ezra was right right as rain. And that is to say that this would preserve the messianic line to get us ready. Certainly, if you look at Ezra chapter 10 and let it play into the subject of divorce in scripture, you don't want this to be your only text. You want to deal with Matthew 19, probably the most complete teaching in the Bible on divorce. It's parallel in Mark 10, a sort of kind of parallel in Luke 16, and then a chapter by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. You wouldn't want to use Ezra 10 as the only basis for the discussion about divorce. So an odd place to end, yes, but on the other hand, maybe an appropriate place to end. We come to the end of this study, and what we see is that God's people had come home. They were far from perfect, but God was preparing for them what Galatians 4.4 talks about that we referenced in the very first lesson, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. This coming home as troubled as it was to get the altar in place, the foundation of the temple in place, the family in place, the Sabbath obeyed again, as troubled as it was, it fulfilled prophecy and it helped prepare for the advent of Jesus Christ.